Okay. Okay, here we go. We have our verdict, Savannah. Here we go. Count one, guilty. Count two, guilty. Count three, guilty. Count four, guilty. You are my special. <laughs> In each fold Stirs my heart That was once cold Burning out Till it's uncontrolled You are my special Won't you make this right While bringing chaos and new Eat it up All you find All that you're having tonight Like a maze For life is wrong Despite the world That they throw You are my special We're special Don't be still Never call that alone We're special you To start off with why you all probably clicked the video, this month saw former US President Donald Trump found guilty of all 34 accounts of falsifying business records in his hush money trial. For those who may not remember, this trial pertains to the $130,000 that Mr. Trump paid to adult film star Stormy Daniels in 2016, shortly before he was elected president. It's important to note that there's actually nothing illegal about a presidential candidate giving hush money to a porn star. What was illegal, however, is that the reimbursement was recorded as a payment to his lawyer for legal fees. This is presumably because Mr. Trump didn't think that the American people would find it cool that he slept with a porn star. The guilty verdict which was passed at the tail end of May, marks the first time in US history that a former president has been found guilty of felony crimes. Sentencing has been set for the 11th of July in just over a month's time, only days before the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. Mr. Trump, of course, is still the Republican frontrunner for the 2024 election later this year, which will see both him and current President Biden face off yet again for the top job. Many may be surprised to know that the 34 felonies will not disqualify Trump from running for president or holding office, as there are only three requirements to be voted president. These are to be a natural-born citizen, be at least 35 years old, and to have been a US resident for at least 14 years. Whether he can actually vote for himself will be another question, as this will depend on whether he is sent to prison. It's a very likely possibility that Mr. Trump will be able to serve his sentence at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida, but this would depend on whether he is sentenced to incarceration and how long his sentence would actually be. In terms of how May's verdict might impact his shot at a second term, this is also difficult to say. A recent survey found that a conviction would make no difference for 67% of voters. Additionally, around 25% of Republicans indicated that they would be even more likely to vote for Trump if he were to be found guilty. Mr. Trump has long campaigned as being an outsider within Washington, and many of his supporters have long argued that his legal battle has been politically motivated. Following the trial, Trump himself would comment, quote, it was a rigged trial, a disgrace. A fundraiser from his campaign would also be sent out almost immediately after the verdict, reading, I was just convicted in a rigged political witch hunt trial. I did nothing wrong. We had to speedrun this story pretty hard as it broke well past our usual cutoff date. But at least as of time of writing, current President Biden has not made a statement. Mr. President, can you tell us, sir, Donald Trump refers to himself as a political prisoner and blames you directly. What's your response to that, sir? Do you think the conviction will have an impact on the campaign? We plan to put together a dedicated video comparing the actual policies of Trump and Biden later in the year. So stay tuned for that as we come closer to November's election. We now move on to the nation of Slovakia, which our writers assure me isn't a made-up place. 
On the 15th of May, an assassination attempt was made on Slovakia's Prime Minister Robert Fico, before he was expected to attend a meeting at a Slovakian cultural center. The would-be assassin, a 71-year-old retired security guard, shot Fico four times in the chest and once in the arm, before he was apprehended. As of time of writing, Robert Fico is currently in a stable condition but is still being closely monitored. The assassination attempt comes just one month after the nation's presidential election, leading Slovakian authorities to believe that the hit was politically motivated. As this was an assassination attempt on a world leader, we could have fucking told you that. It's worth mentioning that Robert Fico's party, the leftist Smer Direction Party, won the parliamentary elections back in 2023 by basing their political platform around pro-Russian and anti-American sentiment. Shortly after winning, Robert Fico's party would entirely cease all military support to Ukraine and abolish the special prosecutor's office which was set up to deal with corruption. To make the situation even weirder, Slovakia has been a part of the NATO military alliance since 2004, membership which in large part is designed to protect from Russian aggression. Robert Fitzo's party then moved to shut down Slovakia's national broadcaster, intending to replace it with a new one which would be under the government's direct control. Critics of these policies claim that they would all weaken Slovakia's democracy, and they're absolutely right. Only earlier this year, protests against the plan to shut down Slovakia's public broadcaster attracted thousands of protesters within downtown Bratislava. One protester stated that if the proposals were to go through, the broadcaster would turn into, quote, a trumpet for government propaganda. Experts also agreed that the plan was more or less a thinly veiled attempt for the country to get its very own state-controlled media. To make matters even spicier, Fitzo and his government would previously step down from power in 2018, after a Slovakian investigative journalist Jan Kuciak was murdered. Kuciak had been reporting on tax-related crimes which implicated a good number of people in Fitzo's party, making his murder very fucking suspicious to say the least. With all of this in mind, Mind, Robert Fitzo's pro-Russian stance, his tireless push to weaken Slovakia's democracy, his policies which are seemingly designed to increase corruption, his obvious disdain for the free press, and his habit of parroting Russian propaganda has made him a lot of enemies within the country. It's speculated that the would-be assassin could have been motivated by any of these grievances, but why he tried to kill Robert Fitzo or whether or not he was working alone has yet to be determined. World leaders from Hungary, Russia, the United States, Ukraine, and the European European Commission have all wished Mr. Fisto a speedy recovery. The month of May saw tragedy strike the nation of Iran, as a helicopter crash in the nation's northwest would kill Iran's president, foreign minister, as well as several others on board. The crash comes at an extremely tense time within the nation, as only last month Iran had launched the single largest drone attack in history against Israel, an effort which would go on to kill zero people. The months leading up to the death of the president has also seen Iran come closer than ever to enriching weapons-grade uranium, an effort which was supercharged eight years ago when the United States pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. Tensions with Western nations have been exacerbated by Iran's steadfast support of Russia during its invasion of Ukraine, supplying the country with a stockpile of Shahid Kamikaze drones. These are just a few reasons why the helicopter crash immediately made a lot of people within the region exceptionally nervous, as the purposeful downing of a helicopter containing Iran's sitting president would escalate these tensions to a whole new level. Quite fortunately, however, Iranian authorities did not seem to believe that the crash was due to any malicious intent by a hostile nation. Iranian state TV would not explain an immediate cause for the crash, which likely indicates that the incident was an accident. It's worth mentioning that the now deceased President Ibrahim Raisi wasn't the most powerful government figure within Iran, with that title going to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Within Israel's theocratic system, the Supreme Leader is a lifetime position, and many had speculated that the President Ibrahim Raisi was being groomed to replace the now 85-year-old Khamenei in the event of his death of resignation. Others have now suggested that Khamenei's 55-year-old son is now the most likely to be next in line for the position. This does come with some problems, however, as although some sources claim that Ali Khamenei is a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, the Iranian Republic was formed in large part as the rejection of the previous hereditary ruler. Despite these questions about succession, the death of the President Ibrahim Raisi likely won't mean all that much for the immediate future of Iran, and immediately after news of his passing, it was announced announced that a new presidential election would be called within 50 days. As this story broke close to our writing deadline, it's likely that more details have since come out about the crash. But as always, viewers can refer to our list of sources in the description.
If you like surfing, sharks, or advanced mechanisms for creating secure online connections, then today's sponsor, Surfshark, is just the thing you need. Surfshark VPN is a piece of software which allows users to appear anywhere in the world with the push of a button. Meaning just like a real shark, users can digitally migrate to one of hundreds of countries anytime they choose. This means if you wanted to watch the 1994 classic TV show Street Sharks, you only have to teleport yourself to a region where it's available and enjoy watching what we assume is something very similar to Ninja Turtles. He sends a competition to a watery grave. Boom! Death. You might also know that sharks never go to sleep, and neither does Surfshark, because while you're out browsing the web, your metaphorical Elasma Branch wingman will be out hunting for ads, trackers, and malware. And if you're ready to shore up your browsing experience, you've actually come at a good time, because viewers signing up with the code on screen can also score themselves an extra four months for free. Alternatively, here's a QR code you can scan, and the deal will be filled in automatically. Did you know there's a species of shark found in northern Australia which can walk on land? This isn't another setup to compare sharks to today's sponsor, by the way. We just think it's kind of fucked up that they can just do that. Anyway, the best part of all is that if you don't find your surf shark experience 100% fantastic, you can get a full refund for any reason for the first 30 days. You could tell them that their brand color makes you confused because you don't know whether it's blue or green, and they'll still give you your money back with a big cheesy smile. Surf shark VPN. It's cheaper than the other ones. Meanwhile, the Taliban joined climate talks with the United Nations. The richest woman in Australia doesn't want anyone to see this portrait of herself, and a magic portal between Dublin and New York is shut down by the fun police. In what is quite an ambitious plan, the United States is attempting to strike a trade and security deal between itself, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Palestine. Described as a three-part mega-deal, the US has said that no part of the agreement will go through unless all three do. The first part of the agreement is a set of security and trade deals between the US and Saudi Arabia. The second part is a formal process to begin the normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel, while the third part is a framework for the establishment of a full US and Israel-recognized Palestinian state. A very big deal. The US-Saudi portion of the deal is not too unusual on its own, with the two nations being steady allies over the last few decades. The newest deal includes security agreements, economic and trade guarantees, and technological aid, including assistance in developing Saudi's civilian nuclear power program. Historically, the US has maintained close ties with Saudi Arabia, who considers Iran to be their biggest rival in the region. Iran has traditionally close ties with Russia, although both them and Saudi Arabia are also being being courted by China. The US doesn't want to lose their power in the region, so passing this deal would boost their sway over Saudi Arabia and its friends in the region. Saudi Arabia would also receive aid in reducing its famous dependence on its oil exports, future-proofing the nation's economy. It may come as a surprise to some, but fostering a normalized relationship with Saudi Arabia has been a goal of Israel for some time now. Saudi Arabia is home to several of Islam's holiest places, including Mecca. As a result, Saudi Arabia holds a fair amount of sway in the Islamic world, particularly among other nations that are majority Sunni. If Saudi Arabia were to recognize Israel, this would encourage other Islamic nations to also recognize the nation. Like everything in the Middle East, however, it's not quite that simple. Saudi Arabia has repeatedly demanded reciprocal recognition of Palestine as a state by Israel and the US as a prerequisite for recognizing Israel. On the flip side, while Israel has quietly pursued recognition, publicly, Israel maintains a critical stance of Saudi Arabia's well-publicized human rights issues. Just like a dissident journalist, they're pretty cut up about it. Israel might demand at least a promise of better human rights from Saudi Arabia to satisfy their own claims before publicly accepting recognition. Finally, Part 3 seems to be the least likely to pass. A repeated demand of Saudi Arabia and several other nations has been the international recognition of Palestine on the world stage. While not outright granting recognition to Palestine, the section outlays a set of binding framework that provides a path to statehood. Benjamin Netanyahu, PM of Israel, has repeatedly stated that he will not accept 
accept any recognition of Palestine. Previously, when Spain, Norway, and Ireland announced that they would recognize Palestine as a state, Israel's reaction was strongly negative, describing it as rewarding terrorism and that there would be severe consequences. Israel even went as far to recall their ambassadors from the three nations. While the US officially supports a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine, they have said that they will not recognize Palestine unless it comes as a part of negotiations. By bundling all three parts of the agreement together, it is hoped that all nations will be able to pressure the others into signing parts that might make them more hesitant. While it has been said that either all three parts will be passed or the entire deal doesn't happen, this might not be the case. There is always the chance that the US and Saudi Arabia, who have the fewest objections, just say, oh well, guess we can't work it out, and then just do the first part as an entirely separate treaty. Regardless, diplomacy is a slow thing, and any deal will likely take quite a long time. In fact, this exact package is kind of old news, as it was initially underway for months even before the Hamas attack on October 7th last year. Rest assured, if anything major comes out of it, or if a multinational deal is done in record time, you'll be the first to know within around 30 days. Crossing over to Kangaroo Land, and this month saw the country witness one of its most high-profile court cases in recent history, the case of whistleblower David McBride. The month of May saw McBride sentenced to nearly six years in prison after pleading guilty to stealing military secrets in 2016. The stolen documents would then go on to prove that Australian soldiers had unlawfully killed 39 Afghan civilians as part of its joint occupation with coalition forces. For a bit of context, David McBride himself is an Oxford-educated lawyer and former British Army major, who would eventually enlist as a lawyer in the Australian Army. During his time serving in his position, McBride would become disillusioned with the military and political hierarchy he was serving, taking issue with the internal handling of sexual abuse allegations and the increased legal scrutiny of Australian soldiers. He argued that the rules of engagement for how soldiers were allowed to operate left them exposed to criminal liability and severely hamstrung their ability to do their jobs. It was his opinion that political forces outside the military were enacting policies that would endanger the lives of Australian soldiers. His view on the matter was best summed up by his own words, quote, if you are that worried about Afghan deaths, why not pull us out? If you want us to fight the war, you have to be able to let us do it. McBride would present his concerns internally with the ADF, but when this failed, he would then turn to the police and the Minister of Defense, before finally turning to the press. Over a period of 18 months, McBride would secretly copy and smuggle out hundreds of sensitive military documents, before eventually handing them to Australia's national broadcaster, the ABC. However, the journalists who have been handed the classified information did not agree with McBride's assessment that Australian soldiers were under too much scrutiny. Instead of focusing on the internal politics of the Australian military, the journalist would instead say, Jesus Christ, there are so many war crimes in here. In an our famous news segment, the ABC, with the help of the provided documents, would detail evidence of how Australian soldiers committed war crimes against Afghan civilians, while their superiors would lie to cover them up. The report has caused a wave of public outrage within the country, as it not only detailed how Australian soldiers killed unarmed men and children, but it also implicated Ben Robert Smith, Australia's most decorated living war veteran and Victoria Cross recipient. Police would later go on to raid the offices of the ABC in 2019 to seize class classified documents, but the journalists involved would ultimately not be charged following pressure from the Australian public. David McBride himself, however, would not be so lucky. After fleeing to Spain for a year, he would eventually be arrested after returning to Australia to attend his daughter's school dance. David McBride would see many years in court, with his lawyers arguing that he shared the documents with honourable intentions, and out of a sense of personal duty. Prosecutors, however, argued that McBride was motivated by personal vindication, and that the documents shared in endangered Australia's national security and foreign policy. Although not explicitly stated, Australia has become increasingly more aligned with the United States over the past few decades, with US Secretary of State Antony Blinken stating only last year, quote, we have no greater friend, no greater partner, no greater ally than Australia. It should also be noted that many of the policies McBride had criticized during his time in Afghanistan had originated as standards set by the United States. It could be argued, therefore, that the move to prosecute McBride is at least in part to appease the United States, as letting him walk could make the country hesitant to provide Australia with military intelligence. During McBride's sentencing, the judge would admit that the whistleblower was of good character, but that sharing military secrets was a gross breach of trust. 
The judge also mentioned that McBride had shown no remorse for what he did, a sentiment made clear by McBride shortly after his sentencing. In front of a crowd of supporters, he would say, quote, I have never been so proud to be an Australian as today. I may have broken the law, but I did not break my oath to the people of Australia and the soldiers that keep us safe. McBride's lawyer would state that they planned to appeal the ruling that had initially prevented McBride from mounting a defense. The judge had previously ruled that McBride himself had no duty as an army officer beyond following orders. However, in the words of McBride's lawyers, quote, we know that the Australian military teach a much broader notion of what the duty of an officer is in a battlefield than to follow orders. Critics of the sentence have pointed out that despite McBride leaking documents that confirmed the unlawful killing of 39 civilians, he himself has become the first person involved to be convicted of any crime. David McBride joins other famous whistleblowers such as Andrew Wilkie, who rightfully argued in 2003 that the Iraq war was based on a lie, and Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks. This month saw Danish pharmaceutical company Novo Nordisk briefly become the most valuable company in all of Europe, success which has been attributed to its pair of weight loss drugs. Novo Nordisk was originally trying to develop medicine for type 2 diabetes, but what they developed turned out to be extremely effective at suppressing appetite. After discovering it had very minimal side effects, the company released it and made a serious medical breakthrough, and it's since been sold as the drugs Ozempic and Wegovy. Hailed by many as legitimate miracle drugs, the demand for something that effectively suppresses appetite has been enormous, especially within the United States. In fact, Novo Nordisk has taken in so much money from the US economy, Denmark's central bank has actually had to lower its own interest rates to weaken the value of its own currency. Since the breakthrough, the sheer impact of Novo Nordisk on the Danish economy has been nothing short of astronomical. Denmark's economy was actually expected to shrink 0.3% in the first half of this year, but this one drug has instead seen it increase by 1.7%. Novo Nordisk is literally propping up Denmark's economy, and the value of the company is actually higher higher than Denmark's entire 2022 GDP. Due to the drug being highly sought after, it's currently very expensive for those who can't get it subsidized from either their government or health insurance provider. One month's supply of Ozempic, for example, can sell for over $1,000, meaning it will likely remain beyond the reach of many until the supply can catch up with the demand. The rise of Ozempic could potentially reshape entire industries over the next few years in ways we've yet to fully understand. Most obviously is the fast food industry which has long relied on creating unhealthy and addictive food. However, with widespread access to such an effective drug that can suppress a person's desire for the entire industry, you can imagine the drug has made a few McDonald's executives pretty nervous. It also has implications for the entire pharmaceutical industry, as there is a long list of illnesses which tend to be much less prominent among people within a healthy weight range. The value of some companies within the medical industry have subsequently tumbled, as treating the root cause of so many illnesses just became a whole lot easier. There are also the implications of what this might mean on a societal level, with many calling for governments around the world to eventually subsidize the drug. The reasoning is that obesity has become so widespread and damaging to a person's level of health, countries will be able to potentially save billions from avoiding preventable illnesses that will never come to be. This is on top of the fact that healthy people tend to be more productive, and generally, governments and societies as a whole just tend to benefit a lot when people are healthy. Of course, the drug isn't perfect, it won't work for everyone. The price currently needs to be subsidized for most people to afford it, and you're still not going to be all that healthy if you haven't left the couch in six months. However, these are all surmountable challenges, and these kinds of drugs have some serious potential to reshape society for the better. Pharmaceutical companies the world over are currently racing to replicate the success of Novo Nordisk, so hopefully this will be able to increase both supply and bring down the cost of such treatments. It's not every day that we actually get to report on some good fucking news, so let's all appreciate this very rare win. 2024 is a year of elections, and next in line is the world's largest democracy, India. An estimated 960 million people of the nation's 1.4 billion have taken to the polls to elect 543 seats of India's parliament, the Lok Sabha. This makes India's upcoming election not just the largest in the world, but the largest in human history. Current Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seeking his third consecutive five-year term. While not a two-party country, India's politics have historically been dominated by Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party (BJP), the largest political party in the world, and the Indian National Congress (INC), the third largest political party in the world. 
This is not to be confused with the IMC, which is a megacorporation faction from the hit video game series Titanfall. Although staying out of power for the past decade, the INC has led India for a majority of its 77 years of independence from British rule. Narendra Modi became PM in 2013, and since then India has overtaken China to become the most populated country in the world, and experienced significant GDP growth from 1.8 trillion in 2013 to nearly 4 trillion in 2024. Despite this growth, Modi has been accused of clamping down on democratic processes, particularly after his party won an outright majority in the legislature after the 2019 elections. Some analysts have described it as the most intense democratic backsliding within India since a period called the Emergency. The Emergency was a 21-month period from 1975 to March 1977, where Prime Minister Indira Gandhi arrested opposition leaders and suspended civil rights. Gandhi would go on to lose her next election in a landslide. Additionally, Modi has faced harsh criticism for allegedly eroding the separation of religion and state. Modi has made several public appearances celebrating the opening of new Hindu temples, including a high-profile visit to one which was built on the site of a destroyed mosque. India is majority Hindu, but both significant Sikh and Islamic minorities. Tension between the groups has led to violence in the past, between riots, pogroms, and targeted killings. Modi's BJP claims that India has risen to its global standing in large part due to its effort to form closer relations with the United States. Modi can also lay claim to popular welfare schemes, which includes providing free grain to 800 million of India's poorest citizens. INC, on the other hand, has criticized the rate of unemployment during Modi's time in office, as well as India's decline in press freedom and democracy. There has also been well-founded concerns about India's treatment of minority groups. It was only earlier this year when Modi implemented a law which allowed Hindu, Parsi, Sikh, Buddhist, Jains, and Christian refugees to get fast-tracked citizenship. The law notably does not include Muslims, which is to say, the officially secular nation of India now has religious criteria for citizenship. Despite this, Modi has nevertheless remained popular among his majority Hindu supporters. With results to be announced on the 4th of June, we won't be able to announce a winner before this video goes live. But as it stands, experts most likely predict Modi will serve his third term in office. For our next story, we turn to the West African nation of Burkina Faso, a country we once again swear we didn't make up. According to a recently released investigation by Human Rights Watch, the ruling military junta committed several massacres at the end of February earlier this year. According to the investigation, at least 220 civilians were injured or killed in a single day within the settlements of Nondin village and Sora, including at least 56 children. The survivors reported that a military convoy carrying approximately 100 armed troops arrived on the heels of a rebel militant group, which is believed to be the organization Jamaat Nus Rat al Islam Muslimin. Apart from sounding like a faction which exists with giant sandworms on a desert planet, JNIM is a radical fundamentalist group which have committed their own fair share of atrocities across Western Africa. In addition, this group is also known to be affiliated with other well known terror groups such as Al Qaeda and ISIL. Reports from across northern Burkina Faso detail how rebel extremist groups have been raiding military supply depots, barracks, and convoys, as well as civilian targets such as religious sites and civilian infrastructure. Violence within Burkina Faso has been raging as early as 2018, but its intensity has fluctuated wildly ever since. According to survivors of the massacre, the settlements were attacked because its residents were suspected to be aligned with the aforementioned terror group. This is despite their claims that the JNIA militants never even stopped while passing through either village. Instead, just yelling a bunch of rally cry bullshit as they passed through. According to the accounts of survivors, the junta soldiers were convinced that these settlements were filled with JNIM sympathizers, although there has been no evidence found by Human Rights Watch to indicate that anyone in the village was aligned with the terror group. As witnesses would explain, the soldiers went door to door through Nondin village and forced the residents to stand in groups, before gunning them down in the street. The convoy then advanced to the next town, known as Sora, and summarily executed dozens of people in that village as well. The survivors also stated that the soldiers would open fire on anyone who attempted to run. We should mention that even if every man, woman, and child in these villages were somehow best buddies with Osama bin Laden, it still wouldn't make their summary executions any 
more justified. The massacres were uncovered by this investigation around the same time that Burkina Faso expelled three French ambassadors over alleged subversive activity. Burkina Faso is not the only African nation to sour their ties with France, however, as their northern neighbor Mali severed their defense pact in 2020 following a coup. It seems like every time a country gets cooed, the French are always involved somehow. The senseless massacres from February could have easily gone unnoticed had it not been for the incredibly brave testimonies of the survivors. Representatives of the current president, Ibrahim Traor, stated in media appearances that the reports of these massacres were baseless, and have since expelled nearly all foreign media. That's not fucking suspicious or anything. Outlets such as the BBC and even Human Rights Watch have had their broadcasts suspended and websites blocked within the country. This in itself would probably be the most damning piece of evidence for proving the massacres, had it not been for the footage of the survivors at the mass graves. It's very likely that none of those responsible for the massacres will be brought to justice if they're being protected by the de facto government of Burkina Faso. With this in mind, as the country has experienced eight successful coups since 1996, Six, it's much more likely that the perpetrators will simply be forced out of power before they ever see a day in the courtroom. We now return to the war, which was led by a comedian on one side and a clown on the other. The month of May saw a heavy amount of Russian pressure put on around Donetsk, Kharkiv, and Luhansk. Ukrainian military forces had been expecting a Russian push sometime into the spring, with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky stating that although they were ready for the ground assault, they were still urgently awaiting Western aid necessary for their defense. We'll come to that later. Meanwhile, on the 12th of May, Russian soldiers experienced the highest number of daily casualties in the war so far. According to Ukraine's military, as many as 1,740 troops were killed in a single rotation of the Earth, alongside the combined loss of more than 30 tanks and 42 other armored vehicles within a 24-hour period. Total losses since the start of the war have been difficult to find and properly compare, as everyone measuring it tends to come up with different figures. According to the United States, however, Ukraine has suffered an estimated 70,000 killed and between 100 to 120,000 wounded. Meanwhile, the CIA estimates that Russia has sustained 315,000 casualties as of their last estimate. The ratio of dead to wounded is unclear. In some good news, however, Ukrainian intelligence very likely aided in large part to its many friends in the intelligence community stopped several Russian plots over the month of May. The first was a planned terrorist attack within the capital of Kiev on May 9th, which saw Ukrainian authorities detain four individuals who had planned to plant explosives disguised with tea bags. Unfortunately for our British viewers watching, the tea used was not identified. However, our best guess at this stage is Earl Grey. It's like licking the inside of a walnut shell, but good! Those arrested had planned to blow up several points of interest around a busy shopping district, with the incendiary mixture used intended to spread fire during peak foot traffic. Ukrainian intelligence say that the evidence gathered from the detained suspects links them to Russia's federal military agency, the GRU. No further details have been released to the public since the incident. The thwarted attack comes the same day of Russia's annual victory parade. Although the burdens of war have made the parade somewhat less impressive than before, only a single tank was seen with in the Red Square of Russia's big day, with the tank in question being a T-34, a model which first came into service 84 years ago. The funniest part of this story, however, is that the T-34 was originally manufactured within Kharkiv, a city in what is now Ukraine that is currently being contested. It seemed as if this might have been a sore spot for Russia, however, as following the failed terrorist attack, Russia would fire two glide bombs into the city of Kharkiv in the last week of this month. One bomb would hit a supermarket containing as many as 200 people killing at least 12 and wounding a further 34. The second bomb would land in central Kharkiv and go on to kill eight people. Commenting on the attack, President Zelensky would state, quote, This strike on Kharkiv is another manifestation of Russian madness. Only madmen like Putin are capable of killing and terrorizing people in this way. It is also worth mentioning that amidst Russian holiday celebrations, another assassination attempt against Zelensky was foiled. This is, at minimum, attempt number 11 to assassinate President Zelensky. This time, with 
two Ukrainian generals trying to coerce those close to the president to kill him. The conspiracy operating out of Moscow ended in the arrest of the two Ukrainian colonels, with no casualties being suffered in the process. Western intelligence has had such a nutty track record predicting shit this year that you have to wonder whether it's in the CIA's best interests to assign a team to guess lottery numbers. Speaking of intelligence, both Germany and the Czech Republic made it known that they experienced a series of Russian cyber attacks targeting politicians and government infrastructure this month. British intelligence also confirmed that Russia is currently plotting some level of physical attacks on the West within the near future, citing multiple instances of cyber attacks linked to physical sabotage style operations. British intelligence also warned about the risks posed by China being of great concern to the world, especially with Russia and China's relationship deepening as time goes on. If that wasn't ominous enough, then you'll be pleased to learn that Russia and Belarus have also been carrying out nuclear weapons drills in the face of Western aggression within Ukraine. With this all in mind, Germany has floated the idea of reintroducing conscription for 18-year-old men within the country, in addition to other hypothetical solutions to combat Russian aggression years down the road. Germany wasn't the only country especially concerned, however, as the nation of Estonia has now even considered sending its own troops into Ukraine. It should be noted that these troops were would specifically be intended for backline jobs, which would be designed to free up Ukrainian soldiers to fight on the front. But as the old saying goes, infantry wins battles, logistics wins wars. While these stories may seem relatively insignificant, they showcase a rising precedent in the face of growing world tensions amidst the war within Ukraine. French President Emmanuel Macron stated earlier this year that he would not rule out sending ground troops to Ukraine should the need arise, reaffirming that Russia must not be allowed to win in Ukraine. With the stalemate conditions within Ukraine, it seems as if the rest of Europe has been increasingly more worried at the implications for a Russian victory. Not only would it mean that a very dangerous neighbor moves a lot closer to the rest of Europe, but letting an invasion slide would set a terrifying precedent for other nations who might be trying to expand their borders. With all of this in mind, foreign aid has continued to flow into the country this month, with British Foreign Secretary David Cameron promising £3 billion of annual military aid for as long as it takes. The United States also announced a new $400 million military aid package, which includes armored vehicles and surface-to-air missiles. In addition, Antony Blinken announced military funding worth $2 billion to Ukraine to coincide with the other military aid package. Meanwhile, Denmark will be providing their own $815 million aid package focused on air defense equipment, while Estonia officially approved the use of frozen Russian assets for Ukrainian reparations. To add to all of the aid above, the United States has begun discussions for allowing Ukraine to use U.S. weapons to strike targets within Russian borders. Since the start of the war, U.S. aid has come with terms and conditions so that Ukraine can't just launch barrages into Russia, as this could be seen as unnecessarily escalatory. Critics of this decision have long argued that invading a neighboring country could also be seen as unnecessarily eschatological. In any case, only time will tell whether Ukraine will be able to fire a few rockets into Russia as a treat. To cap off our coverage with something a bit more fun, this month saw Russia propose plans to unilaterally redraw its border lines in the Baltic Sea, a proposal which would be withdrawn without explanation less than 24 hours later. The only elaboration provided by Russian authorities was a simple message stating that the draft is deleted. Some speculate that the nation might have suffered its very own NAM flashbacks, remembering the last time it tried to fuck with Finland. In any case, we'll chalk this one up to a misinput and end our coverage of Ukraine here. Tune in next time for another segment of A Single Russian Fuckwit Making It Really Hard For Everyone. News is over, so it's once again announcement time. Firstly, our last video is actually our very first in the series to be permanently taken down by YouTube. YouTube stated that the video was in violation of the platform's misinformation policy. However, at least two out of three of their reviews of the video were entirely automated. We would go on to ask YouTube specifically where in the video we had misinformed our viewers, to which they would reply, quote, We are not allowed to pinpoint this for you. They would instead refer us to their YouTube policies page. We suspect it may have been a part in the video where we explain how an Iranian state TV channel showed a fire in Chile and claimed it was from an attack in Israel. YouTube's automated systems may have just misunderstood that we were dispelling this misinformation as opposed to spreading it. In any case, after removing the nine seconds from that video and re-uploading it a few days later, we haven't had any more problems. The reason you don't see too many similar series to News Without the Bull 
bullshit is because YouTube makes it very hard to make these videos sustainable. Towing the line between covering world events without censorship and maintaining a presence on YouTube is an extremely difficult balancing act. A single scene has been enough to have our videos hit with an age restriction which effectively stops all viewership immediately. On top of this, half of the stories that we cover are usually enough to get a video demonetized from any ad revenue. The entire reason we're not afraid to use copyright music in every intro is because after going years of not getting any ad revenue anyway, we figured we might as well double down and let ourselves use some cool songs. This is why if you ever see an ad on this series, it isn't because YouTube has actually decided to pay us, but rather the copyright holder is running ads because they own the monetization rights to the video. All of this is why we're exceptionally thankful for every single Patreon subscriber who has supported us over the years, and who keeps supporting us through every release. Just having a consistent budget means we can cover pretty much anything we want without having to bend around YouTube's strict requirements for monetization. This series very much lives on the backs of everyone who supports us. So if you want to throw a few bucks our way, or just get your name in the end credits, a link to help us out will be down in the description. Moving on, our database of experts we started compiling from viewers last month is about halfway finished. This will allow us to pull from a huge pool of professionals, and hopefully make the news better than ever before. We would have liked to have had the database up and running for our writers this month, however Jake the Analyst was very selfishly too busy getting married. In any case, you should be able to start seeing the benefits in next month's episode. Lastly, if you haven't already, maybe check out our second channel, Sir Swag Academy, which is kind of like the main channel, except Swag himself has very little oversight for what stupid ass topics get covered. Who has the 11th most translated Wikipedia page? <laughs> MC117 says rice gum. I completely forgot it's that not... name. <laughs> A link to that, as well as everything else we've talked about, will be down below. On behalf of the entire team, we'd like to wish everyone a happy June of 2024.